Hi everyone, welcome to the CEFC Green Room. My name is Grace Tam and I'm your host for today. Firstly, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners and custodians on the land on, on which I'm broadcasting today, the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation. And I pay my respects to the elders, past, present and emerging. For those who don't know me, my name is Grace Tam. I'm a director at the CEFC. I specialize in green bonds. And I've invited today three experts to join me on this webinar. Let me introduce you to them now. Firstly, dialing in from phone, we have Gavin Goodhand from Altius Asset Management. Gavin is the Senior Portfolio Manager and Co-Founder of Altius. He has 26 years of experience in fixed income markets and was most recently with QBE Asset Management's fixed income team as Senior Portfolio Manager. Manager. He holds a Master of Business in Finance from the University of Technology, Sydney. Next, we have Michael Chen. Michael is the Head of Sustainable Finance Team at Westpac Institutional Bank. Michael and his team help customers connect their financing with their strategic sustainability objectives. Michael is currently co-chair of a working group within the Australian Sustainable Finance Initiative and he holds Masters of Sustainability from Cambridge University and is also a chartered accountant. Finally, we have Bridget Bull. She's the Head of Production and Content at the Climate Bonds Initiative. Bridget has been at the Climate Bonds Initiative since 2012, where she spearheaded the global green bond database and key research publications that the industry rely on today. Bridget has been working in sustainable finance for 12 years, including in London and in South Africa. So today's formal session will run for about 40 minutes, followed by about 10 minutes of Q&A. And we'd love to hear from you. So please ask us your questions using the Q&A function on your screen. And at the end of the webinar, there'll be a questionnaire. Please share with us your feedback and on what topics you'd like to hear from us in the future. So let's begin. I thought we should start off with a brief overview of what green bonds are and how the markets evolved to date. So Bridget, can you please help us with that, with the brief overview of the green bond, uh, what green bonds are, how the markets evolved today and how much you think issuance might be by the end of the year? Sure, Grace, and thanks very much for having me here today. Um, so green bonds are really simple financial instruments. They they're act just like any other bond. The only difference is the proceeds are ring-fenced towards green projects so that the, the spending is on green projects or assets. Um, the definition, though, of what is green and what is a green project or asset is not universal. And so it's guided by some overarching principles, like the green bond principles, which provide a good basis for the disclosure and structure and overview of what a green bond is. But this doesn't go into definitions of what is green. And this is, this is where the Climate Bonds Initiative, as well as national and regional guidance, picks up. Some of the national and regional guidance is mandatory, most is voluntary. And many have heard of some of the developments that have been going on the, around the world, like the European taxonomy and the China Green Bond Catalogue. These are uh, more on the mandatory end of the spectrum, but there are many other countries that are either following suit in developing some framework of definitions, adopting those that are already out there, um, or providing voluntary assistance to green bond issuers within their market. Um, the market has evolved a great deal. So, you know, from, from less than 10 billion US dollars issued in, in 2011, with the first corporates coming out around then with, with green bonds, um, to around 50 billion in 2014, and then just over 250 billion issued in 2019. So it's, a, it's been a huge growth, this market. Um, to date, in 2020, the issuance was a bit hit by the, the COVID crisis, but has reacted quite strongly and um, has almost reached 200 billion to date. Um, it's also been bolstered by a number of other types of debt formats, which we've seen emerge along with the green format. So we've seen social bonds and we've seen sustainability bonds. So social, quite obvious what they cover, and sustainability covers a mix of green and social projects. And those markets have also grown alongside the, alongside the green bond market. So yeah, climate bonds role is to, is to help the market and define what is green to track the market and, um, and to provide information to 
global and regional and country-based markets on, on what's happening in the green bond market. At a push, we think issuance this year might just reach around 250 round billion, two. which was last year's figure. Um, but we've been very encouraged by the growth of other formats, which had almost reached that 250 billion just in the first half of the year alone. So there's been a lot of growth across the market, whatever you call the name, many of them all in, all in support of sustainable, the Paris Agreement and Sustainable Development Goals. Wow, Bridget, that. those are really <laughs> big. <laughs> yeah, those are really big numbers there. So what about the issuer mix globally? Has that changed over time? Yeah, it has changed quite a bit over time. So you saw the market particularly in the early net days, really dominated by development banks who, who kicked the market off, the European Investment Bank, World Bank and others. Um, so they were really dominant in the early days. They still are very important uh, and very influential, but they make up a much smaller percentage of the market. And the market's now much broader to include um, financial corporates, non-financial corporates. They've always made up quite a big portion of the market um, and growing. And now we've seen the, gro the real growth of, of sovereign markets, which is what everybody was waiting for. Obviously, sovereign debt makes up such a huge proportion of, of uh, non-green debt markets globally. And the first sovereign green bond was only issued right at the end of 2017, so really quite late in the day. But that's, that's really grown hugely and, and now comes to make up, you know, um, I think around 15% of the market, so, so quite, a large, um, right, quite a large chunk. And, and definitely 2020 um, has seen this grow even more. So government-related entities, sovereigns, sub-sovereigns, government-backed entities, um, because of, you know, Build Back Better programs and, um, and the, the COVID crisis, we've seen even more issuance um, from government-related entities. So, yeah, we've seen a, a huge mix of issuers and also a huge mix around the world. So, you know, going from very much a developed market phenomenon to include many emerging markets. I mean, it's still very small in, in, in sort of overall terms, um, but quite large in, in, in local terms. So um, that's, that's been a, a really encouraging um, growth. And we've also seen a, a much more diversification of sectors, you know, away from the low hanging fruits, the easy green, to much more challenging definitional sectors. Um, and, and we'll chat more about that later, I'm sure. Great. Thank you, Bridget. So, Michael, I might turn to you now. How do those global trends contrast with what's happening here in Australia? Sure. Thanks, Grace. And good afternoon, everyone. Uh, those trends that Bridget outlined, uh, Australia pretty much, I guess, at a very high level mirrored uh, some of that, that growth in, in, uh, in, in, in the offshore. So the Australian green bond market really opened with World Bank's kangaroo green bond issuance back in 2014. Uh, and since then, it's experienced that sort of rapid and exponential growth that Bridget pointed to offshore. Uh, the biggest issuers in Australia would be sort of the financials banks. Uh, as well as the semi-governments, state governments, uh, and uh, corporate issuances. We've seen some in the university sector as well. Um, in Australia, similarly to what Bridger pointed to, um, the COVID, uh, I, I guess, um, uh, you know, affected the market in quite a big way. So the first three quarters of this year in Australia was pretty depressed from a green bond perspective. And I point that to, I guess, um, two main reasons. Firstly, there's a there's a temporal perspective, which is a lot of finance teams push back green bond and sustainable finance plans, which is coming back around. Uh, and understandably, because during that time, finance teams were trying to get their house in order and made sure they had adequate liquidity and such. But the temporal piece aside, there was all the, the I guess, this weird world we're in also created some distortions. So I point to here specifically, for example, some of the banks receiving, you know, cheap liquidity by way of the term funding facility from, from the Reserve Bank. Uh, and the banks have typically been big green and sustainable bond issuers, uh, but because of this cheap liquidity, they haven't had to tap the, uh, the wholesale senior market in that way. Um, so, as I mentioned, sort of a, a pretty slow um, first couple of quarters, and we, we Australia didn't see some of that social pandemic response issuance that uh, Bridget pointed to. But look, this is rapidly turning around. In the, in the last couple of weeks alone, we've seen numerous green bond issuances, be it state governments, so um, New South Wales, Queensland, uh, corporates. So, so Len Lee did a green bond a couple of weeks ago. 
uh, and also some asset back structures, whether it's uh, from from Bright or, or, or Flexi Group. So, the market I think is is coming back, and based on our discussions with clients, you know, I I expect a a strong year ahead as well. Great. Thank you, Michael, and thank you, Bridget, for the brief overview. I think that really puts um, the green bond market into perspective. Um, and so for today's webinar, I thought it'd be interesting to talk about, you know, from an investor's perspective, um, how, you know, why do investors set up a green bond mandate or ESG mandate, um, the ev evolution of an investor's journey. So, Gavin, I thought I might turn to you. Are you able to give us um, an overview of the experience that Altius had in developing your ESG mandate and the journey that you've had? Thanks, Grace. Yeah. Um, look, Altius' um, first involvement in the sustainable markets was when we introduced um, a sustainable bond fund back in 2014. Um, there were a couple of reasons why we did this. We were seeing a um, investors, our investors wanting to express an alignment uh, with the investments that they made. And also there was a lack of actual product with, within the market at that particular point. When I look back at 2014, we were, we were not overly experienced in the, in the ESG market or the sustainable markets. So we actually drew heavily on some of our core seed investors um, who had uh, years of experience investing in sustainable in the sustainable market and they they help put together the frameworks and the policies that we use for our sustainable style products um, and those those policies and procedures are um, still used today uh, from from those early days there's probably three key things that came out or things that we did uh, we developed what we refer to as our sustainability advisory committee which i'll have a talk of, i'll talk a little bit more about um, in a minute we appointed an external uh, asset consultant or uh, sustainability consultant. And then we also developed our sustainability policy document. This document is, is a pretty important and significant document for us. It governs the way we look and uh, examine uh, sustainable funds. And that then uh, also plays back through to the way we look at issuers and also product like green bonds. The key things behind that document, um, it covers things like um, the negative screens that we run on particular funds, and that will include things like gambling, alcohol, nuclear, thermal coal, etc. We look at things around materiality, which is obviously very important in this in, in the sustainable space, and it really that's really examining um, when issuers have very small exposures to some of those negative. Um, areas that I just briefly talked about, what we actually do with those issuers and how we treat them. And then finally, um, we, we use uh, our sustainability advisor provides um, ESG ratings on all the names that we do. And this policy defines how we utilise those particular ratings. Uh, the now, those ratings are covering, covering things around the environmental and social governance practices of any particular firm. And it also then gives us our thresholds on what is what we consider as best practice in, in this space. But I think the most important piece for us and the most unique piece is the, is the Sustainable Advisory Committee. Um, this committee governs and looks after the sustainable, um, sustainable policy document I just mentioned. Um, it also has the right to bring up, uh, you know, question any issue that we have in our in our portfolio. Ask for additional research on that name. It covers, it looks over the exclusion lists that we have, and generally it's a free. Um, it's a committee that discusses any form of ESG issues that we see uh, permeating through the market. But the one key thing, or one really interesting thing, is this is where our engagement. Um, kicks off and we, we do quite a bit of engaging with, with issuers across a range of issues. Um, so I thought it would be quite interesting to give an example that's relevant for the green bond market. Um, that's uh, Woolworths. Um, so Woolworths obviously issued a green bond early in 2019. At that particular point, Woolworths was an excluded issuer for us due to its gaming and its alcohol businesses. Um, but 
the middle of last year, Woolworths actually decided that they were moving or they made an announcement that they were going to divest from this business. And at that particular point, we, we, we looked upon that and then we looked at the overall sustainability framework that they'd put in place for their, their green bond and the assets that they'd include in their, their green bond and how they were aligned with Paris. And we thought there was a, it was an appropriate time to bring to take that forward to the committee. So the committee itself was um, was comfortable with the inclusion of this uh, of the green bond into our investment universe. But one of the stipulations behind it was that we the committee asked us to remain engaged with Woolworths, which I think is really important. And the idea is that we well we will be communicating um, what we determine what we uh, talk through in our committee meeting, and also to indicate to them that um, if they if they do move away from that divestment strategy, then the review of that. Uh, position will be will actually be undertaken. And I think it's quite it's quite interesting because obviously Woolworths made some announcements this morning, in particular around uh, Dan Murphy's up in up in Darwin, which has obviously had a lot of um, community uh, negative feedback. So these sorts of this is also going to be incorporated into into our engagement letter with with Woolworths and just putting forward how we see how we see that and our position on on. Um, on that particular issue. So, you know, that, that covers how we look at the um, e, pure ESG space. How, that, how it's actually evolved is, you know, over this journey, we've actually added additional resources to our team and those resources have had, a, um, have had focus on ESG particular issues. Our head of credit research has uh, fully integrated now um, ESG into our financial metrics when examining any particular issuer. So not only are we are looking at the operational standards of, of an organisation through uh, the lens of our sustainability advisor, but we're also now incorporating ESG factors into the financial um, quality of, of that corporate. And that can influence, and it does influence, uh, our investment strategy within those organisations. Um, and then I suppose the final piece of the evolution, which is quite relevant, is the introduction of something like it is uh, the introduction of our green bond policy framework. And that really defines how we look at a green bond. So, you know, we're looking at things when we drill down, we're looking at how the organisation's strategy is aligning with the overall sustainability framework that the group has put into place. Um, what assets are actually being included within that that portfolio? Are they aligned with Paris? Who's selecting those those assets? You know, the um, how are they monitoring the the funds when they're coming in? Because clearly, there's there's got to be a segregation of those assets under any use of proceeds document or bond. And then I think the most important piece um, is the reporting aspect. So you know, reporting for us for a green bond is is key. Um, it provides additional transparency for us into the way an issuer thinks about sustainability. But another thing is that um, we gather this information, collate this information to present back to our end investors. Because one of the things that we're starting to see in the investment space is that investors are wanting to um, see impact. They want to be able to see where their money's flowing and make sure that there actually is impact attached, attached to that. So um, at a high level, when, when an issuer does come to the market with, say, a green bond, they need to go through all of these stages before it becomes an eligible security for, for all the funds that, that we actually look after. And probably just a, you know, one final thing is just circling back to the incorporation of ESG into the whole of um, our credit research, that starts to then, per or that basically then permeates through the entire business that we run from an ESG point of view and places a lot of focus on ESG credentials of an organisation. Right. Thank you, Gavin. That's that's really interesting. Um, going off script a bit here, but I just wanted to check, um, ask you, so d does it take more time from an investor's perspective in terms of, um, you know, looking at a, a green bond in investment? And also, I wouldn't mind asking Michael whether or not, you know, then when, when an issuer comes to market, would you also recommend that an, an issuer spend more time when they're looking to come to market with a green bond? 
I might start with Gavin. Uh, yes, it does take more time. Um, is a simple answer. Obviously, we will go through our our standard credit research process um, and determine whether we're interested in the in the issuer in the first place. So, if if an issuer does not pass that criteria, uh, we consider an issuer uh, of weak credit quality. Then we may actually stop at that particular point. You know, once we get um, once we get the thumbs up and on that area, we will then drill down and look at the the documentation that's attached to the, those green bonds. As I mentioned, we'll look at the verification processes that they went through, read through the assurances that they've, they've gone through, uh, and then try and get a better understanding of the overall assets that they've put with or the projects they've put within that, that bond itself or what's been referenced within that bond. So it's actually quite important. And we also, as I said earlier, we want to make sure that there's a, a clear alignment um, of the issue of sustainability with that actual green bond itself. Because I think that's 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 important. Right. Thank you, Gavin and Michael. So, when you um, you know when an issue comes to market, would you um, recommend that they take more time than a traditional vanilla bond? Uh, well, well, by virtue of going down a label product, whether it's green or something else, uh, it is it, it, there is more time involved. There's there's no sort of two ways about it. Um, but I guess the question is, so why, why would an issuer want to go down this path, especially given more time is required and, and also additional costs? And I think, you know, I only reflect on my conversations with issuers maybe a few years back when they asked this exact question, you know, do I get a pricing benefit? Why would I want to put in the work? Um, but we only need to reflect on some of the things that Gavin's talking about, you know. I think... In, in, in my issue, in my meetings with issuers these days, um, the energies of the energy of the meeting is entirely different. You know, I think the finance team is walking into those meetings with a greater appreciation on the importance of ESG. Um, you, you know, I think Gavin talked to how his fund uh, thinks about integrating ESG in its investments, not just green bonds. And we find that with a whole raft of other issuers too, um, equity debt issuers, they're asking companies these sorts of questions around the ESG performance. And of course, um, companies, issuers, I mean, customers are asking them more questions around ESG. Uh, and as we've seen recently, there's more sort of, you know, ESG climate litigation and regulation coming in. So, you know, I mean, it's a long way to answer your question, Grace. Um, yes, it does take more time, but, you know, what I'm finding is teams are actually more uh, invested and they want to put in that time because of all these external factors that I point to. Right. Thank you. So, you know, on the topic of issuers, you know, Michael, we have seen the, the low-hanging fruits um, coming, coming to issue like, you know, banks, property developers, rooftop solar, um, personal loan lenders um, and state governments. So what do you think is the next group of issuers that will be coming to market? Yeah, this is a good question, Grace. Um, and if I may just take a step back and um, answer it this way, which is Bridget talked about definitions around green and, and why it's so important. Uh, and, and that's been confirmed by, by Gavin as well. So in all those sectors that you point to that have issued the low hanging fruit, that's because the green definitions has been around for quite some time. Um, so I, I mentioned this because um, the, the new standards, sector guide, guidelines that are coming around, defining exactly what it is green. So a good example of that would be the waste criteria that the, the, the kind of bonds uh, put out. Um, so now that we've got good, specific, globally accepted definitions around what exactly does green look like in the waste sector, I expect we see some issuances potentially in that sector. Uh, what else? Um, I think in residential property, uh, there's there's sector definitions lying around, but the Australian sort of um, the rating schemes, as, as you and I, Grace, we, we, you know, you and I talked about this previously, that's currently being refreshed, and we're likely to see that coming out next year. So, once we have sort of better standards and definitions around green residential property, I think we'll see m much more issuances uh, in that space. Uh, and we haven't touched on transition yet. Obviously, outside the green label, there's also transition bonds. Um, this is where sort of, I guess, 
more emissions uh, intensive companies or issuers are looking to, to become more green. Um, so big energy companies, I, I suspect, will be looking at the transition format closely. Uh, um, and also the hard to abate sectors, whether it's you know things such as steel or aluminium manufacturing or, or um, chemicals, for, for example. Now that they've got sort of transition guidelines and definitions hopefully coming out soon, I suspect um, that sector will, will, will see more issuance there too. Bridget, I might um, throw throw that over to you there. You know, what are you seeing from a transition bonds perspective? What developments um, is the Climate Bonds Initiative working on at the moment? Yeah, sure. So we've just published a white paper on, on what can transition mean. And this is um, partly because there have been some transition bonds issued in the market, but there's there was no kind of clear definition of what this means. Is it kind of a, a halfway house to green? Is it ambitious but applicable for a different set of se sectors? What is what does kind of transition actually mean? So, um, you know, we have always been at the, of the view at the Climate Bonds Initiative that if a company is making a transition in line with the Paris Agreement they should be called green, you know, whatever whatever their starting point. Um, and their bonds thus can be called green and whatever the type of issuer. However, the research that we did and the people that we talked to along the process of developing this white paper um, kind of brought out that there was a useful distinction to be made for activities that do not have a long-term role to play in the low-carbon economy and those that do. So Michael just mentioned, you know, the, the set of criteria, um, the set of sectors for which we have criteria is continuously expanding, like for waste. But there will be some activities that don't have a set of criteria because there is no decarbonisation pathway for them. You know, thinking obviously on the extreme end like coal, there is no decarbonisation for coal itself only transition away from coal rather than transition within the activity itself. So so that's kind of the, the paper that we put forward so that there could be a really useful demarcation of using this transition, using the green label for investments that have a long term role to play in the low carbon economy and are following you know, the, this, the decarbonisation pathway in line with the Paris Agreement. But the transition label can be used for those that are making a substantial contribution to the Paris Agreement. So that's either zero carbon by 2050, but also um, halving emissions by 2030. And that, that's really important. Um, but they do not necessarily have a long term role to play post 2050. Um, so, you know, an example could be early decommissioning of coal, um, you know, potentially gas flaring, like, you know, we, that can be debated. Um, the other way we see the, the transition label being useful is those that will have a long term role to play. But at the moment, we have no idea what that pathway to zero carbon looks like, or, or we have very limited idea what that looks like. So, you know, Aviation is a classic example of this. We all know that we're going to need planes post-2050, but there's no quite kind of clear uh, decarbonisation pathway, although I'm, I'm being told that this is, this is changing. But it's, at the moment, that's quite a hazy view. So, you know, substantial retrofits to airline fit, uh, fleets to operate at a max of synthetic fuels might be an example of, of things that fall within this ca category. So thinking about, say, you know, oil and gas um, and thinking about transition not being light green or greenwash, you know, that, that's a really important kind of founding principle. We can't lose this opportunity. We've got, made such great strides within the green bond market, as Michael said, you know, that the criteria are really important with this, that it's in line with, with the Paris Agreement. Um, so the key is that it's that anything with a transition is labeled as um, ambitious. And, and I've already mentioned, you know, thinking about transition away from some activities and transition kind of within how to decarbonize certain activities. So, you know, that means that maybe things like um, efficiency upgrades to oil and gas refineries are probably unlikely to be likely to be eligible within any of these um, labels. I mean, there, there, there's arguments to be made and we, we're not talking about CCS that could be brought in, you know, we'll, we'll get there. But um, but then perhaps in kind of thinking about um, interim t solutions that really lead to dec um, halving emissions by 2030, um, you know, substantial reduction in gas flaring might end up being a part of that. So that's kind of a transition within a, within a type of activity. But others must be transitions away. 
So it transitions away from, from solid fossil fuels. And, and if a company as a whole is on a pathway that is in line with the Paris Agreement, and this can be evidenced, and that's really key, not just by commitments, but by operating metrics, the entity as a whole could be issuing transition bonds. And, and we, we're not there yet. We don't have the, the, the criteria for assessing a company as a whole or for assessing for some sectors, what a, a pathway looks like. But this is kind of the direction we're heading in and, and the work that we're trying to do in the background to make sure we're, we're on that pathway. So yeah, we've just released that white paper. You can go and have a look at the website if you like. Um, and uh, yeah, it's a, it's a really interesting uh, area of development. Wow. Thank you, Bridget. That's really interesting. Um, I thought I might just pivot the conversation here to talk about, you know, the impact of COVID um, on the bond market in general. So. Gavin, you know, what have you seen in the Australian market? How has COVID impacted the issuance um, and investment of bonds in Australia? Thanks. Thanks, Grace. Um, look, actually, um, Michael mentioned a lot about this um, a little bit earlier, but just to reiterate it, um, you know, obviously COVID did have a significant impact on the issuance of, um, of green bonds. We were expecting another record year this year. Um, but, you know, there's been a lot of positive signs in the last four weeks. As, as Michael mentioned, we've seen five, effectively five new uh, issuers come to the market. But I think, you know, um, another really positive thing for the green space is the level of over, oversubscription we've seen for these transactions. So, in particular, something like New South Wales T Corp transaction that came was uh, four times oversubscribed. So, you're seeing lots of solid support for green... Um, assets and green bonds at, at this particular point. Um, and I think that's that's been reflected overseas as well. I know um, the Climate Bond Initiative has done some stuff, has done work on, on pricing and that sort of thing. And that boils out and plays out in the, in the European markets as well, where there's a decent amount of oversubscription to all transactions that have come in. I think the, the one question that sort of keeps coming up around green bonds is uh, the, the premium, potentially premium, whether green bonds price better than, um, than your tra traditional vanilla. And what we sort of observe, and there's, there's, there's not a lot of research out there at this particular point on it, but there has been a couple of uh, small pieces that sort of point to green bonds you know, trading slightly tighter, you know, anywhere from two to five basis points, depending on the sector, and some in, in some high emitting sectors actually a little bit higher than that. So investors definitely are um, comfortable in, at the moment, in, in paying a little bit more for that, for a green bond. And I really do think that that um, plays to that supply-demand imbalance that we have within the in the space. The... the um, the investors are definitely going down. Investors are definitely going down that ESG pathway, and you know the amount of assets in the pure green space is obviously limited. So that that demand is definitely um, outweighing supply, and that's been reflected in those those over subscriptions that we're seeing in, in bonds. Thank but you. As Michael, probably as Michael also noted around the t what the RBA is doing with the TFF, which is which is important as well. Is, as banks have been a big um, issuer into this space, um, a lack of issuance from the banks and refinance next year um, could impact the amount of uh, issuance in the green market going forward. Mm. So, Michael, I might I might ask you a follow-on question on that discussion there. So, you know, with the recent green bonds, Australian green bonds that have come to market, you know, did you see any new investors being attracted to those bonds or, you know, were there any changes or, or you know, differences in terms of a vanilla bond versus a green bond in terms of investor engagement or, you know, supply demand um, attracting new new investors? Yeah, good question, Grace. Uh, and I think there, there are quite a few clues in what Gavin's just already mentioned. Uh, look, I think, in, you know, whether it was looking at a Woolies Green Bond or the recent issuances by the uh, state governments, they're really, really good corporate credits. Um, not corporate credits, just good credits in general, rather. So the, the order book is always going to be uh, well bid, right? So that's probably the first thing um, observation that I'll make. But particularly to, uh, sort of around new investors, I mean, um, the, the nuggets that I mentioned around what Gavin's mentioned is, uh, you know, there's dedicated ESG and green funds that more and more of them that's being set up, you know, as the months go on. 
we saw this coming out of Europe a few years ago, and we're seeing a lot more in, in the Aussie space, not least um, sort of Gavin's um, funds. So what the, what that's translating is, you know, positive screens with specific mandates on buying green investments. They they bid into the book, so that leads to that oversubscription, that pricing tension, which Gavin spoke to. But look. It's not just about the, the green dedicated investors. Some of the other things that Gavin spoke about, which is how the broader credit research process integrates ESG factors, that also translates into how more conventional mainstream funds think about these instruments. And I didn't, you know, you only need to look at the press and more and more super funds, uh, asset managers are looking to, excuse me, the, the online shopping, bit of a delivery. Um, you only need to look at the press of what's happening in the investment space. There's more announcements around funds looking at the emissions intensity of their portfolio and how they're looking to sort of um, decarbonise. So that, or that will translate into uh, investment decisions as well. So a bit of a long-winded answer there, uh, Grace, but all these factors combined drives that um, investor demand and that oversubscription and the pricing tension, the investor stickiness uh, points that Gavin mentioned. Yeah. Thanks, Great. Michael. Just one follow-up thing, just on that. Um, you know, PwC in Europe actually released a report yesterday um, around um, sustainable investing, and uh, one of the interesting things was that they're saying that 77% of institutional investors said that they would um, move away from non or would not buy non ESG-related products by 2022. So you can see now, obviously, Europe is quite a step ahead of. Um, of the world in the uh, in the sustainable space, but it, I think it highlights what's going on. Excellent, and and Bridget, you know, do you have any any comments to add to that? And I know CBI has covered a lot in terms of global pricing differentiation uh, for green versus non-green, and and different issuers. Have you got any any additional comments that you can add? Just realised I'm on mute. Sorry, um, not a huge amount in terms of what's already been said. I mean, there's very the the data that um, we track is really USD and Euro issuance because it's really hard to come up with any solid conclusions on on any of the other currencies. There's just not enough um, data. But basically, I think in all markets that we work in, which is a lot, there's we don't seem to be hitting any kind of demand limit. There's certainly problems with supply, but we cert I don't think we're reaching anywhere close to, to any kind of uh, meeting demand. So I, I, there is that supply-demand imbalance, and I, and I don't see that changing for the foreseeable future. In fact, I think almost the interest in ESG investing is growing at a rate faster than, than the green bond market um, can, can provide product. But m maybe uh, that's not based on any uh, specific data points. I'm just That's kind of what I see just as an overview. Um, I mean, we, we do see very high oversubscriptions um, with green bond markets. The, the research that we did on the, on the last six months, on the first six months of um, 2020, showed that um, around only around 55% on average of green bonds were allocated to investors with green or ESG man mandates. So that might be lower than some people might think. So there's actually quite a lot of demand outside those with specific mandates. Um, you know, the, the green bonds tended to achieve a higher book cover and spread compression than vanilla equivalents. So we track kind of equivalent vanilla bonds, although it's not a perfect comparison. Um, and then importantly, you know, we look at um, pricing um, after, you know, after close and seven and 28 days after pricing, green bonds had on average tightened much more than their vanilla baskets, you know, vanilla, vanilla equivalent baskets. So so that's, um, that's also kind of quite a key point. So we are seeing some... Thing, you know, aspects of pricing coming out, but you know, really, I think that's very much to do with the supply demand imbalance that's been touched on. Thanks, Bridget. Michael, I might turn back to you here. So, you know, given all these dynamics in the green bond market, you know, what drives an issuer to consider issuing a green bond? Um, you know, given there's quite a lot of um, involvement in terms of setting up a green bond framework, etc. Sure. Um, so first thing I think is that piece around the investor diversity point, uh, bring on new investors onto the book, which we've talked about already. Uh, and secondly, um, some of that pricing discussion that we just had there, what that points to as well is 
um, what that offers to issuers is potentially a more successful execution uh, in going down the green bond path. And um, we saw that actually during um, COVID. So in the months of, you know, um, March, April and May, where there was an extreme volatility in dislocation, what we saw was that green bonds were more resilient uh, because investors were more typically buy and hold types. So, um, yeah, there's that resilience piece uh, in, in terms of secondary performance in times of volatility. So um, investor diversity, uh, more successful execution. And, and thirdly, uh, and not to be underestimated, is it, it gives issuers a platform to talk about their climate change credentials and ESG credentials. Some people call this reputation benefit, but I, I don't like that phrase because it sounds a bit fluffy and because I think that the, the benefits are much more tangible than that. Um, Gavin's already spoken to how they think about um, assessing ESG within companies and, and issuers. So it gives issuers a platform to talk about what they're doing more around um, ESG. For example, that Woolies one was a great example. Um, it also allows um, the, as I mentioned previously, issuers to communi communicate to their customers how they're broadening out their sustainability strategy to looking at their financing as well. Um, and as I said previously, you know, regulation, court cases, civil society uh, is, is more increasingly focused on ESG matters. So it gives the issuer a great platform to talk about what they're doing to those um, stakeholders too. Thank you, Michael. I think that's a good sick way to um, go to live audience Q&A. Um, so the first question is related to this engagement um, point and it's a question for Gavin. Um, the question is given ESG focused investors are still a small portion of capital flowing into fixed income markets, how do you get access or influence issuers via your engagement activity? Thanks, Ray. Look, yeah, I, I agree. It's um, you don't see a lot of engagement uh, in fixed interest markets. You mainly see it in in equities. But yeah, you know, for us, that still doesn't mean that we shouldn't be putting forward our views to um, to to issuers. You know, the debt the debt markets are the biggest provider of of capital to to them to these markets. And to, you know, to date, we've we've actually gone down the path of engaging with um, a number of different. Um, you know, sectors, we've engaged with the banks, we've engaged with the universities, which is obviously quite important. And you'd be surprised at how responsive organisations are when they're receiving feedback directly to um, from their from their investor base. And especially, you know, we're reflecting back to them um, not only what comes out of our sustainable advisory committee's uh, view, but also what our investors are actually asking. So, um, yeah, and and most of our engagement is directed up through senior management. You know, Woolworths will be uh, directed towards um, you know, CEO, and then we've uh, addressed things to the board directly. So yeah, I think as time also as time goes on, I think um, you're starting to see some of this engagement from debt holders out of Europe as well. The more that come uh, start to look down this this path, I think it starts to get great attraction and you'll start to see companies respond more to uh, debt holders. Right. Thank you, Gavin. The next question is um, a question on how the green impact of green bonds is being quantified um, and if so, how is it measured? Maybe one for Bridget. Yeah, sure. So it, this really depends um, across a number of issuers and, and it depends also on the sector. So I guess um, on, on some issuers, you have very big reports reports that come out of issuing a green bond with a number of metrics quantified across the different projects and activities that they are um, investing the, the proceeds into. And um, that could include a bunch of different things. So, you know, for renewable energy, it could be um, greenhouse gas emissions avoided. Um, you know, for water, it could be water savings, et cetera, et cetera. So, so there's, there's that kind of side of things. Um, and that kind of varies across the scale to smaller issues and more simple, I would put, quote unquote, um, bonds where there's much less um, friction measurement of impact over time, uh, over time. And I would 
posit that that's not necessarily a bad thing. So, you know, we we tend to like more is better when it comes to disclosure and you know that that's that's probably a fair point but in a for a lot of green bonds to have issued a green bond particularly if it's certified by the client bonds initiative or has has received um external verification elsewhere it's already jumped through quite a few hoops to get there and so um they've met a number of eligibility criteria for that particular sector which means that they kind of are already green now i would say in, in for some sectors um, that means that I would, wouldn't say impact reporting is all that important. So particularly for renewables, um, the, the solar plant is built, it's uh, you know, producing electricity for, as far as the client bonds initiative is concerned, that's, that's fine to report on the fact that it's still, you know, it's not curtailing its electricity in high percentages, et cetera, et cetera. Um, but for some that, uh, sectors, these um, to overtime metrics are much more important. So I'm thinking particularly around um, green buildings. You know, you can you can look at a building and you have no idea whether it's green or not. But what really makes it green is, is its metrics and, and how it's delivering on these, as well as how the building's built. So it can be built with great um, fabrics and that makes it green. But if the building operator runs it poorly with the windows open and the AC going or, you know, however else, then then that's kind of all null and void. So those operating metrics then become quite important. And those are part of, a, a lot more part of how um, disclosure and reporting post issuance is followed up on as part of um, the client bonds recommendations. So yeah, so I think it, it, it de depends on, on the sector and, um, and the type of issue as well. So as a follow on question, so what happens if a, a bond comes to market labeled green, but then it didn't turn out being green? Um, what happens there? I might maybe Bridget, start with Bridget and I'll throw it to yeah. um, Gavin. And yeah, sure. So it, 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 suppose it, it depends a little bit on, on where it's issued. So at least to date within the green bond market, and that might change in Europe, um, as they're looking at developing a green bond standard. But at least to date, there's been no legal in underpinning for what a green bond is in most jurisdictions. So it, in, in a sense, they can do whatever they like and they can call it whatever they like. But there are these voluntary standards and commitments such as the Client Bonds Initiative and et cetera that, that um, provides you know, rigor to the market. Um, if a, in, Under the Client Bonds Initiative standard, if a, if a bond doesn't turn out to be green or doesn't deliver on its promises, then the certification mark gets taken away and that is uh, reported publicly. Um, that's different under various other systems. So um, for a lot of funds receive a second opinion and that is um, only applicable at the point of issuance. Some of them um, have uh, also follow up, but that's kind of optional. Um, so we haven't really seen so many examples of what happens. I, I mm -hmm. would hazard a guess that the market has changed enough that if a, a second opinion is given at the point of issuance and that turns out to that bond turns out to go sour, that opinion provider, you know, they, they all have most of them have such good um, standings within the market would would uh, provide an opinion piece or something, um, some press release or something on that deal. That, this is just my guess, just because I, this is the way I've seen the market develop and, and it's become a lot more rigorous. Um, and so, so that's what I think would happen. But on the face of it, there's no kind of legal underpinnings. Although this is, this is going to change probably in Europe and, um, and in China it is already different. So it's much more legal structures mm -hmm. under which a bond is issued. issued. Gavin? Yeah, not a lot to add. I, I think the only other thing is just the reputational issue for the issuer itself uh, and, you know, whatever future issuance plans those organisations have because that will play back through to, um, yeah, to the way the market treats them. And that, can, and, and that could play out with higher pricing. Mm -hmm. And Michael? Yeah, I... I... I agree with all the above. I mean, there's not, not a lot of precedent to point to. Uh, and prima facie, it doesn't seem too sort of dramatic in that you just lose the green label. But I think how you would translate in the market is probably um, uh, sort of, you'll see far more far reaching impacts. And by that, I mean, I mean, if I think about sort of green bond indices, they will likely be removed from the various green bond indices. Uh, and also, if you lose the green label, then what will investors do to it? You know, will they dump um, the, the security? So how, how then will that affect pricing? And then to, to Gavin's point, in terms of the future issuances, not only will it affect future green issuances, but potentially the vanilla ones too, because it calls into question 
their overarching ESG strategy. So, I, I, yeah, I guess I summarise it in terms of, you know, um, prima facie, probably not a lot of damage, but uh, if, if a label were removed, I think um, it, it'd be pretty, uh, it won't be received well um, by the market. Yeah. Um, a somewhat related question has come out in the live audience question. Um, and the question is how, um, how standardised is green bond reporting by different issuers from different parts of the world? Is there, is there a standard set, setting body or regulatory mechanism to control that aspect? Might start with Bridget again. Yeah, I mean, there, I guess the, there is no um, standard. There, there is a standard setting body in the green bond principles, but these are voluntary, and they have very, mm -hmm. you know, very good. Uh, principles to adhere to in terms of uh, reporting, but they don't necessarily provide any kind of completely standardised reporting. Um, so the reporting is different around the world, and and a frequency is different. For example, in China, um, at least initially, uh, issuers were encouraged to respond quarterly, um, whereas in the most of the rest of the world, it's annually. So you know, so there are differences, and and there are differences in. Um, in, in what what is reported as well, um, we we do try and um, kind of synthesise that. We do, do, do a lot of data collection each year and try and um, have a look at, at reporting. Um, and it, it's it's quite difficult to uh, track how everybody reports differently. But we also do provide some templates which which issuers can use um, to to kind of help that reporting. And I think this will also change, you know, as we move from a much more voluntary towards a more regulated mm -hmm. um, system. Even if that even as Australia is not within that system, I think the market will just tend to move to adopt those best practice principles, and I think we'll see some more um, standardisation of reporting. Mm -hmm. um, I think Bridget, as Bridget, I... sorry, as Bridget just said, I think the the fact that um, we've already touched on the the EU sustainable finance model and the fact that there's going to be regulation rolled out in 2022, I think as Bridget highlighted, that will start to become best practice and as a result you'll start to see that you know flow through to other markets such as such as here as well yeah yeah and um i might throw it over to michael to comment about you know the general overall you know evolution of um you know different reporting that the banks are, are, are looking to do such as um you know impact reporting in tcfd Sure. Uh, that, uh, big, big question there, Grace. Um, so, I mean, in terms of general sustainability reporting, that's been happening for, for quite some time. And the TCFD reporting has typically, um, that's only been an area of focus over the last couple of years. And that typically either goes into the sustainability report uh, amongst banks or, or corporates in general, or it's a standalone um, document uh, covering like, the four key areas of the TCFD. The impact report is a very separate report. It reports to, I think, as we discussed already, the, the actual, as the name suggests, impact that the bond is having through the activities that have been financed or refinanced within that actual bond. So for, for all things green, it will capture you know, the, um, the emissions abated um, to, to what Bridget's talked about. Uh, and if it's a broader sustainability bond or a social issuance, a couple of social metrics as well. Um, and I'd just like to echo what Bridget said around there's no, even though there's no uniformity around what is reported at the moment, I mean, a lot of companies are giving this a really fair go. It's not easy. I mean, we've, we've, we've been there in terms of uh, impact reporting. It's not easy. There's a lot of data um, involved. Um, but it is become better, it, it's become better and better, and, there, and it will become more standardised. So um, it's a big topic, you know, you know, in the green bond market, you know, sort of, um, what is a good Im impact report and such. But I just wanted to point out, yes, um, it isn't easy and, and a lot of companies are doing this uh, really well already. And I think you will only get better with, um, with, with standards coming out in the EU and other places. Thank you. Okay, we have five minutes left. So I thought I might conclude with some quick fire closing remarks. Um, Michael, I might start with you. Sure. Looking into the future, you know, what do you think about the green bond market or ESG in general? 
I'll start with green. I think the focus on green isn't going to go away, uh, even though there's all these new labels coming out. Uh, and in the broader sustainable finance market, I think green will continue to be the biggest sliver of, of, the, of the overall market, just purely because the scale of the decarbonisation task to get to net zero, it's, it's really hard to wrap your head around, actually. It's a, it's a massive task. Uh, and even in broader sustainability bonds, most of the activities that the proceeds are used to fund it is green. So the green story will continue uh, and, and it will continue to boom. Um, secondly, broader ESG, I think, um, you know, the social story has really uh, come to fruit this year and, and for the better. Social has previously been, I guess, the poor cousin of ESG. Uh, and as we've seen, this healthcare crisis, um, you know, uh, has really highlighted that the social side of things are really important. Uh, and we've also seen in this country too, some of the, um, you know, the indigenous and land right issues being important as well. Uh, and also issues such as affordable housing. So the social side of things, I think, will, will also continue to grow. And last but not least, um, transition. So we've, we've talked about that already. I think the green bond market has been fantastic in mobilising green, but there's a huge amount of issuers in the hard to abate sectors that we need to bring along in the sector. So I'm really looking forward to um, seeing that uh, market, the, the label transition market, uh, flourish too. I'll leave it there, Grace. Thanks. Thanks. And Gavin, what about you? What trends do you expect to see from the investor community? Oh, look, yeah, like ESG will just continue to grow from strength to strength. I think there's, there's become, you know, investors are, well, the superannuation industry and that sort of thing uh, is definitely placing more emphasis on that as a uh, as something that should be looked at. But I think also for investors, um, you're starting to see a differentiation of sectors driven by ESG concerns. You know, sectors, I'll touch on something like the coal sector. Um, investors are starting to... Um, examine the coal sector and try and determine where that goes uh, goes forward. And and that is being started, is starting to be uh, incorporated into pricing of new debt that's coming into the market. So I think that's, a, that's definitely a big change for, for investors. Thanks, Gavin. And Bridget, what about you? Yeah, I mean, I think just picking up on um, Michael's points, really, you know, I agree in that I think Green will remain kind of is here to stay and probably the biggest slice of the pie. And if you think about that, it's it's much easier to to put kind of green assets into a, in a into a green bond and social assets are a little bit more harder to define. So although we're going to see a lot um, of growth in that space, and certainly I think we're going to see much better definitions and criteria of what it means to be in line with a you know to social the sustainable development goals and others. Green is here to stay, and I think. Um, we, you know, we we are going to see much better, um, particularly definitions of the Paris al Paris alignment of what that means at both an entity and an activity level. And we didn't we didn't really touch on um, target based finance like sustainability linked loans mm. and sustainability linked yeah. bonds. But you know, this is going to be a key part of how we can show that entities as a whole are linked to a transition strategy um, and and what kind of metrics we use to define that. And I think that's really interesting space. Um, that, that we'll see a lot of development in, um, particularly in, in this transition space. So, yeah, I really see a lot um, a lot of things happening there. And then, yeah, much better harmonization and creation of taxonomies around the world and, and better, um, you know, harmonization of global definitions around green. So, yeah, I think it's a really interesting space. And, and I'm also looking a lot at, at better ways to entice emerging markets into this, um, to, to attract financing from these markets, um, you know, in local currencies particularly, and, and supported by development banks. These are, you know, all the different issues we're trying to look at. So that this is a transition across all sectors, but also across the globe. And that, that is really, really important. Um, I've seen some really, really um, interesting questions come up in the, in the Q&A we weren't able to get to. So if anybody wants to contact me afterwards, I'm always up for a juicy discussion. So please do. Thank you, Bridget. Well, that concludes our webinar for today. Thank you, Bridget, Michael and Gavin for your time. And audience, I hope you found today's webinar insightful. Please, if you have some time, fill out the questionnaire at the end of the webinar. We'd love to hear your feedback and let us, let us know what you'd like to hear from us in the future. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.